start with these two quotes, and that's my contact information if you need it. Um, so the George Bernard Shaw quote, I think, connects with me because a lot of time when we are talking about technology and tools and so on, um, I think what he said is, what are they going to talk about is something that, you know, we often wonder. It's like, what's going to happen when we use these tools and so on? And I think the Theodore Nelson one works for me because it says that even though we spend a lot of our time thinking about the wires and the cables and the Wi-Fi and, you know, how do we get things to work, it's the vision, the unifying vision um, that is more important. And to throw one more quote here, so I'm going to start with this one. Um, take a look at this. It says that the introduction of the use of the Internet may prove as epochal as the wheel or the steam power. How many people agree with that? Let's see a show of hands. Okay, we have a few people. That's okay, I'll come back to that quote in a minute. Uh, but I want to start with some apologies. Firstly, I've been a little sick in the last few days, so if I have to run to the bathroom, you know why. Uh, in between, I also apologize that uh, I might be repeating myself some of the slides because I've had a couple of sessions already, so to those who were at those sessions, sorry. And finally, I want to apologize for not being the other Indian, uh, the hole in the wall guy, because a couple of people have come to me and said, oh, Dr. Mitra, it's great. I'm like, no, I'm Mishra, and that's Mitra, and you know. Um, so he's, he's, he's tomorrow, okay. So if you're here for him, you can go. I won't feel bad, it's all right. I uh, also want to thank um, the conference organizers and the high school here, and Justin, and all the people who have worked uh, really want This has been just a wonderful experience for me um, to be here. Um, just a wonderful environment, great school, and you know, just meeting and talking with people has just actually been uh, great, uh, despite the little illness and all that. Um, so a little bit about myself uh, and my dream. Um, my dream is actually to be in The Simpsons. <laughs> and um, that's sort of what I would look like um, if I were on The Simpsons. Um, more seriously, uh, I'm a faculty member at Michigan State University. MSU. Um, I direct the master's program in educational technology, and a uh, couple of our grads are here in the audience, and I've met a few, and I was supposed to meet some people for lunch today, and I apologize, I couldn't make it uh, for that. Um, if I would be remiss if I didn't speak of my friend and colleague uh, with whom I've done a lot of my work. Um, that's Matt Kaler. It looks very cool, both with sunglasses and without. And um, we spend a lot of our time um, thinking and talking, you know, apart from having beer, um, uh, about technology and education, and particularly uh, what is it that teachers need to know. So that will be a main focus of what I will talk about today. But to come back um, to the original quote, so I had this, and what this quote essentially says that this network of devices is going to be greater than the wheel or the steam engine. The only problem here is that I lied to you because that quote is not about the internet. Any guesses as to what that quote was about? Blackboard, Slate. Okay, I'll let you, I'll tell you. It's about the talking picture, all right? And this was an academic book written by somebody back in 1933, uh, University of Chicago Press. So anytime I see that, I have a copy of that book, and I keep it there by me because he said that this would be bigger than the wheel or the steam engine, and we know how that turned out, right? And so the question is, what have we learned? And, and this is an actual slide from an educational video, and I love the fact that they got a typo in there. So, so what is it that we have learned uh, through this process? Um, and I think that one, the biggest thing really for me is that we have to be humble. We have to show some humility when we talk about technology and schools and change and so on, for the simple reason that these are larger institutional um, issues at stake. There are cultural, social, all kinds of issues at stake. So thinking about change, um, that we can just introduce a device or a bunch of devices into uh, a larger organization or a, you know, a social structure and think that change will happen right away uh, may not be uh, appropriate. But the other thing I think we need to think about is how we frame the discussion around technology and education. Because how we frame and how we see the issues become really important because it influences what we see, the kinds of decisions we make, the money that we put in about teacher training, about what students should be learning, and so on and so forth. And one of my biggest criticisms in this context has to do with what I call the technocentric frame, which puts technology in the center and says that here's technology, and now if we put it in, all these kinds of good things or change and all that will happen, uh, which is sort of another way of saying is moving beyond sort of I love technology which is typically, you know, technology types are that way. It's like, oh, this is so cool, right? And that may be, but I'm going to question technocentrism, and I'm going to do it um, using sort of three different arguments, okay? The first one 
is that technology is changing at an extremely rapid rate. Um, <laughs> this is sort of, if you think about it, the other way of looking at it, of course, that nothing much has changed if you look at the first one and the last one, right? But one of my favorite slides is this one, which looks at different technologies and different generations um, it took for that technology to come around, right? And a generation, according to my favorite um, resource, Wikipedia, is around 25 to 30 years. So if you think about speech, it was 10,000 generations ago that speech happened, and that's what sets us apart from the rest of the, the animal kingdom. And you know, there are people can quibble about it, but complex speech is something, and that's what brings about culture, allows us to communicate, allows us to grow our knowledge, and so on. We have to go around 9,250 more generations before we reach the next big one, which I would call agriculture. Now, when you think about agriculture, it leads to this idea of distribution of labor. Somebody's going to hunt, somebody's going to take care of the, you know, the goats and cows, and somebody's going to educate the kids. So uh, us, as educators, sort of emerge just 750 generations ago as a profession, right? Uh, moving forward, printing, uh, uh, writing around 500 generations ago, and that leads to history and the uh, ability to transfer knowledge across generations, across time. Um, and a huge step, right? The next step, printing. Now, this is interesting. Printing is just 24 generations ago. And it's this ability to print knowledge in these little flimsy things and transfer it to each other. That if you think about it, post Gutenberg, you have the Reformation, you have the Renaissance, you have the American and the French revolutions, the idea that all men, humans, are created equal. It comes from this technology of print. The fact that there is no longer an arbitrator of who decides what we know, what we should know, but that knowledge can be distributed freely. The idea that all people should be literate. I mean, those kinds of ideas come about because of this technology of print. Moving forward a few computers, a couple of generations ago, internet email, one generation ago. How many people have teenagers? How many people work with teenagers? A whole bunch, right? So my kids, I have two teenagers. And I can't send them email because they never check their email. The only way to get in touch with them is either text them or send them a message on Facebook. So email, according to them, is for old people. You know, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, anyway. And this is the world sort of that we live in right now. And I spent a little bit of time picking up some, you know, logos from here and there. And I think we really have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to live in this world where something like Wikipedia exists, or, you know, uh, World of Warcraft. What does it mean when our kids, our, our world is enmeshed in these kinds of tools and technologies? And then when you think of Web 2.0 tools, you know, user-generated content, what are the implications of that for us as educators? And if you think about, you know, I mean, it's this Web 2.0, Facebook, Twitter, things like that, which led to something like the Arab Spring. And to think of that, I mean, it didn't lead to that, but it helped make that happen. And if somebody would have come to me and told me like six, seven years ago that I have this really cool idea, you can send 145 characters of text and you can send it out to the world, how cool is that? I would have said, what a stupid idea, what are you gonna do with that? <laughs> right, I mean, what sense does that make? And look at all of us are on Twitter and there's this Twitter feed going on for the conference. I've already seen a bunch of people say, oh, I've been, I'm sorry I couldn't make it and I'm following it through Twitter. And you have this. So when, we think, when I think about when I was growing up, you know, how information is to come at me, uh, I was growing up in New Delhi, and if I, I love to read, and if I wanted to get some books, I'd have to go to the British Council or to the USIS library. And that was a one and a half hour bus ride away, and I'd go once a month, get these bags of books, and then go back the next month. So information was sort of like this. And now, it's like this. And it's no wonder that when you're an educator, you feel like this. Okay, and this is actually a, a real sculpture in um, the University of, uh, in Twente University in Netherlands. And when I've turned around, I love doing photography, so walking around, I see this, I'm like, I do a double take, like, is this a real guy? So I went back in winter again to check, and he's still there. <laughs> <coughs> so what this means is that we need to rethink how we think about what technology is in the first place. So rethinking technology, I think, is the next way of sort of questioning this idea of technocentrism. So a question I ask is that what is an educational technology? And so we have all these different things, everything from a magnifying glass to a crayon, to an Xbox with a Kinect system, Facebook, video, camera. 
I mean, which of these are educational technologies, which are not? And the answer that Matt and I sort of talk about is that there is no such thing as an educational technology. What we have is a variety of different technologies, and our job as educators is to repurpose, customize them for our needs. And I want to talk a little bit about that. So this is a scientific calculator. You can go into a university library, and you can find dissertations written about how this can be used to teach mathematics, right? The problem is, in today's terms, that it's a single function device. And the devices that we have today are these ones, which do you know, mathematical calculation, do scientific calculation. Is this an MP3 player? Is it a device to play videos with App Store? What is this thing? How many different things can it be? It's a very protein kind of a device. And when I talk to teachers about what happens if every child in your class has a device like this, they often mention this idea of loss of control. And when they talk about loss of control, they often mean things like that when I'm teaching the Pythagorean theorem, some kid is on YouTube, somebody is texting somebody else. And I say, that's not real loss of control. Real loss of control happens is when you are teaching the Pythagorean theorem and somebody discovers online another proof of the theorem that you don't know. That is real loss of control. So the problem when you talk about technologies is that most technologies are not designed for education. You know, they're not designed for educational purposes. But here's the good thing, is that as users, we are always redefining technology, okay? So my favorite example of that is email. How many of you have sent an email to yourself? Okay, a very strange group of people here, right? <laughs> Because if you think about it, if you're walking down the street and you see somebody talking to themselves, you're gonna cross over, right? You say, I don't wanna be with that guy. But we do it, right? I mean, what do we do it for? Why did you send an email to yourself? Remember. To remember things, as a reminder, as a calendar sort of a thing, okay? To-do lists, what else? Move things from one calendar. There you go, move things from one place to another so that if you wanna go home and work, you don't wanna carry it on a thumb drive, you can just email it to yourself. So you use it an archive system, you use a to-do list. My favorite is this guy I met at this conference who came and talked to me after my session, and he said, you know, I'm a teacher, and sometimes I get into real trouble with my administrators, and then I sit down and write a long, really heartfelt, angry email, and I send it to myself. <laughs> I said, brilliant. That's very good. But again, email was not designed for all of these purposes. It was not designed for therapy. It was not designed for archiving. But we do it very easily. It doesn't, it's not like we are we think we are doing something incredibly creative. But at some level, we are. We are taking these artifacts and using them in ways that they were not designed to be. I collect examples of these. So here's one, which is uh, both a lawnmower and a bicycle. This is a Chinese restaurant um, where they use clothespins to keep track of orders. Another restaurant in Taiwan, which use pushpins to keep track of orders, again. This is from India. Um, this is called... Uh, Maruta, which is basically you go to the junkyard and you get pieces of different cars and trucks and you sort of put it together. Um, duct tape and magic is what I call it. Um, and it just runs at sort of five miles per hour kind of a thing. And a piece falls off and then you go get another piece, tie it up and you work again, right? So, but the question is why is this important? Why is this important for us? I think it's important because only repurposing makes a technology an educational technology. And I think that's a really important thing for us as educators to think about. And an example that I give is sort of like Microsoft Excel. A lot of teachers who teach math use Microsoft Excel. Now, Excel is clearly not designed to help teach kids learn mathematics. There are too many options, kids get lost, the cells are too small, right? But we do, why do we do it? Because it's on every computer. Because Microsoft is a big corporation and it you know, has it on every machine. That's fine, we work with what we have. And I think that's something that educators are really good at, working with the resources that we have. Another example of mine, which is sort of a favorite example of mine, is of repurposing something, is textbooks. If there's one thing that's been designed specifically, at least claimed to be for your classroom, it's a textbook, right? But what do you do? We say read the following chapters, don't read this, here is some supplementary material. We are again taking something which was supposed to be designed for us and then customizing it for our own needs. And I think that we need to start thinking of all technologies in that way. And this repurposing, is a creative and an innovative act. And the crucial mediating role here is paid by the teacher. And every once in a while, I hear some rhetoric of teacher-proof curriculum. And if there's one thing that I've learned in my work over the last 
you know, it sounds funny to say decades, but it really is. I feel old all of a sudden saying that, but decades, is that there is no such thing as a teacher-proof curriculum, <laughs> okay? So two arguments for questioning technocentrism, rapid rate of change, and think that we have to repurpose, rethink how we think of technology. Third argument for questioning te technocentrism when it comes to education is that it ignores two very important things. It ignores the content and the pedagogy, if we think only of the technology. So technology changes how we teach, okay? The greatest, I think, educational technology that has come about in our lifetime is this one. I mean, just think about it. A kid in Botswana, a kid in East Lansing, Michigan, a kid in Hong Kong, suddenly has access to information that, more information that any generation ever in human evolution has ever had access to? I mean, just the idea of it is mind-boggling, okay? Now we can ask questions about how much of that information is valid and can we verify, can we do this, can we do that? I agree. But it, that leads to what I call Punya's 23rd law of parenting. And there are not that there are 22 before, uh, but I like prime numbers, so that's why it's 23. <laughs> so there's a 37th law of writing, you know, so on, right? So, um, so the, this is with my kids is, for facts, go to Google, for wisdom, come to me. Right? Because it's a world where we can find out that information. You can go online and look it up. But wisdom, now that's something else, right? What to do with information, how to you know, make generalizations based on it, how to make inferences, how to think about it, that's something else. So you combine Google with things like OpenCourseWare, with videos like Khan Academy, with Web 2.0, user-generated content, and so on, with this idea of bring your own device to school. So clearly technology fundamentally changes how we teach. Growth of online learning. So when you look at these two, you can't see them as separate from each other, but you rather see them as overlapping with each other. It's that intersection that is of interest to us, where technology and pedagogy come together, right? So technology and pedagogy are two pieces there, but, and uh, this is what I call a big but, Because teaching is always about something, okay? We call that content, disciplinary knowledge, mathematics, physics, music, art, you know, physical education. So in some way, Howard Gardner says that the, one of the greatest inventions of humankind is the, are the idea of the disciplines, that we can carve nature up in terms of physics and economics and, you know, uh, mathematics and music. And the beautiful thing about disciplines is that they teach us how to see, teach us how to look at the world and understand it, make predictions about it, you know, make sense of it. And we do it by, it, disciplines allow us to develop new forms of knowledge, give us purposes for why that knowledge should be developed, gives us methods. So the scientific method is very different from the artistic method. If you want to teach somebody to write a poem, it's not the same thing as having them run a scientific experiment. And there are different forms of representation. You know, math and music both have squiggles, but they are very different squiggles. So there is a form, there's a way of learning and thinking that is bound in the disciplines. And that's sort of the key part of what schooling and learning is about. So you can look at all of these disciplines and each of them allows us to see the world in a different way. A physicist sees the world in terms of forces and actions and responses. An artist sees the same phenomena and might see it in terms of aesthetic responses, right? So that's a big part of what schooling is about, what education is about, is learning to see the world through these disciplinary lenses. However, somebody who's good at a discipline, so a physicist or a poet, knowing a discipline does not necessarily make them good at teaching it. We have all met faculty members when we were in college who were maybe the top-notch person in their field, and when it comes to teaching it, they can't do it. And this was sort of Schulman's key insight that Teaching a discipline is really about transforming a discipline to make it amenable to be understood by someone else. To understand the learner, to understand the kinds of misconceptions they can have, to understand what developmental stage they are. So that's the key idea of pedagogical content knowledge. And coming back to technology, technology changes what we teach as well. If you look at any discipline today, it has fundamentally changed because of the advent of new technology. Anything. Physicists do simulations of you know, galactic collisions. Mathematicians do that. Musicians compose music on this, and they do all kinds of computational stuff. Videographers, anybody you look at, video game designers, technology has fundamentally changed every discipline. 
And that's not something new. I mean, it's been going on forever. So I was presenting at a conference in the Netherlands, and I wanted to give a local example, you know. So I went online and I looked around and I realized that the microscope was invented by a Dutch guy. And so that's the Dutch guy, except I didn't know how to pronounce his name. So I went online and said, how do you pronounce? And I copied and pasted his name. And this is what is amazing about the internet. Somebody in Boston had the same question at some point and went and did more than I did, went and actually recorded three different voices and put it up there. And so you can hear what it sounds like. Antoni van Leeuwenhoek. That's how you're supposed to say it. And I thought, how did she know that I would need it five years in the future? <laughs> you know, but I think that's the beauty of the internet, which is like people put these things out there. You know, the small pieces loosely joined, and what kind of connections emerge out of that are just fascinating. But this technology of the microscope changed the way fundamentally that we think about the world, that a drop of water has millions of little creatures in it. I mean, germ theory, everything emerges out of that. My favorite example of how technology and content constrain each other is this one, the periodic table of elements. We have all seen this. It's, I'm sure, in a chemistry lab here. There's a nice big poster of it. The problem is that if you look at it, if you come along the rows, if you come to number 56 barium, after that, you're not supposed to go there. You're supposed to go down here and go along this row. You see the two rows in the bottom? So ideally, the representation of the table should be this way. But most of the representations are this way. Any, why? Hmm? Because of the technology of the print, which is you'd either have to make it fold out or you'd make the cells really small and chemists want to pack a lot of information into the cells. What's fascinating is that if you go and look at, if you just go online and do a search for different representations of the periodic table, this is when I was a graduate student in Illinois. I was ready to do my dissertation on evolution and biology and how people learn that. And then I got this book called Multiple Representation of the Periodic System. It had 400 different representations. Things like this, three-dimensional ones, spiral ones, and they're all right, they're not wrong. And so chemists are having all this fun creating this stuff. They're still creating new ones today. And to our students, we give one representation, say that's the truth with a capital T. You know, I think that's very interesting. And now that restriction of the cell size is gone, because now what you can do is you can click on this and you can watch a video of the element and so on. It fundamentally changes the way we engage with chemistry and elements in the periodic table. So again, content and technology also interact with each other. Okay? And it's that intersection that is interesting. So we have talked about content, technology, pedagogy, all three things. Now, all of this happens within specific contexts. Okay? So if you're in a one-on-one -on -one kind of a classroom, that's a very different context than this classroom in India, where internet access may be or may not be available. It's there for just half an hour a day, or the classroom is open for so long. Or when you have these mobile devices that kids can carry around with them. Or the context could be something like this, where the state of Missouri decided to ban teacher-student friendships on Facebook in their infinite wisdom, of course or in situations where students in Denmark allowed full access to the internet during exams. And this was interesting, but I thought that was interesting. And so I followed up, and later one of the comments from somebody in the ministry was that, that they had to change the tests because they have to ask more how and why questions rather than when or who questions because you can quickly look that up. And that, to me, is a very interesting example of sort of the subversive nature of these technologies sometimes. When they come into the system and they change other things which they were not predicted to or we didn't think about. So what do all these things mean? So, so far we have all of these, but they should not be seen as being separate from each other. The idea is that, that they overlap. Okay? That all good teaching happens at the intersection of technology, pedagogy, and content. And that's sort of the key of the model that we present, which is called the TPAC model, and I'll come to that. So it's this interaction between how technology, pedagogy, and content, that's the important thing, not seeing them in isolation. So we offered this uh, thing up back in 2006, uh, and we called it TPCK model. And people asked us things like, and how are we supposed to pronounce this? Is this the toothpick model? Pe you know, I thought these guys are my friends, but maybe not. So anyway, so it was this. And so what we did, being academics, we wrote a grant, and we got $50, and you can buy a vowel 
um, 50 bucks gets you a vowel, and so it became the TPAC framework. Much easier to pronounce. And the other way of thinking about it is what we call the total package. Okay? And we argue that whether you're teaching with a chalkboard or you're teaching with a computer or the web, teaching is always about TPAC. And when we talk about technology here, it doesn't necessarily mean the latest, the best gizmo around. Pencil and paper is a technology. You know, a book is a technology. Chalk is a technology. A whiteboard, blackboard, or blackboard.com, these are all different technologies. Okay? So quick little bit of history. I don't want to spend too much time on it. Um, we wrote this article in 2006. There's a handbook of TPCK. This is before we got the money to buy the vowel, uh, which is out in 2008. Um, the article has been cited a lot of times, which is great. Um, more interestingly and, and, and more rewarding, I think, for us is the fact that a lot of organizations across the US and across the world have started using this framework, thinking about this framework in terms of developing the teacher education curriculum, in terms of professional development of teachers. Um, there's been research article dissertations. Um, Matt and I are going to be in Australia um, in less than a month, I think, or around a month, um, because of this huge teachers, uh, Teaching Teachers for the Future project that's going on there, which I think is 10 different colleges of teacher education, which have used the TPAC framework as a way of rethinking um, the curriculum uh, for teacher preparation, which is cool, which is very rewarding, really, uh, to think that we sit in East Lansing, Michigan, and we write something and we do some research and we publish it and it can have such an influence and gets me to come here and meet all of you. It's what can be better, right? Um, if you want to know more, tpac.org um, is a good place to start. Uh, I would recommend that. So I want to move on from that. So what have we learned about teachers and technology and technology integration? Well, one thing is we know one thing that research has shown what doesn't work. What doesn't work is seeing these three things as being separate from each other. Schulman's work has been around for a while, so people typically have some pedagogical content. So if you're going to be a maths teacher, you'll get some courses in mathematics, you'll get some courses in general education, but you'll get some courses in math education. But technology typically in most teacher education programs ends up being this course out there. And I see the same thing happening in a lot of teacher professional development as well, where you have come in for this day, one day of PD, and we will teach you how to build a wiki, how to build a website, how to you know, use Twitter. Right? And I don't think that that really does work. And I think what works is when you look at these pieces in an integrated fashion, when you're thinking about the technological capabilities of this tool for teaching specific content. The way we represent mathematics is different from the way we think about music or art or literature, right? Or writing and so on. There has been quite a bit of research on different ways of developing TPAC, and I'm not going to get into the detail of that. If you're interested in that, please send me an email. I can send you some articles. So we have focused a large part of our work on the sort of learning by design approach, but other people across the country and the world um, have been developing other ways of thinking about developing TPAC. But I want to focus on something which I feel is really more important than that, which is thinking about how these technologies can fundamentally change what it is that we do, that how we can break out of the box that we are sort of constrained in and thinking about the transformative aspects of use of technology, okay? So a lot of focus has been on sort of spend on technology use, and people up to Cuban, as early as Cuban, have argued that just because somebody uses technology doesn't mean that they know how to teach with it. So a large focus has been on technology integration. What I would argue is that we are at the point where we need to start thinking about innovating with technology, coming up with new ways of teaching um, with this technology. And I want to give a few examples. Okay, the first one is um, this high school in Italy, uh, which computed the distance to the moon, finding freely available MP3s of the, you know, the recordings of the conversation between mission control and the, the astronauts uh, on the surface of the moon. And if you listen to it carefully, you'll see that there is an echo. There's a slight echo between the last, well, let's say, you know, the eagle has landed, and if you listen carefully, you see it landed. And that's because the electromagnetic signals are going from the Earth to the moon and back again. Just like when you're making a, you know, international phone call, sometimes you get that echo, same way. And so what these guys did is they took Audacity, which is an application for actually people use for making podcasts and so on, and used it as a data analysis tool. So zoomed in, and you can see over there the little echo, and computed the gap between the sound and the echo. And the teacher set kids up in groups. They had to decide where they should, you know, so there was error and all that in that. But once you got that gap, all you have to do is divide it by two and multiply by the speed of light, and you'll get the distance to the moon. 
And they were so accurate that they could actually tell when the moon was closer to the Earth and further away because the moon doesn't go in a perfect circle. So to me, there was like a really interesting little activity that was done. But for me, what was truly fascinating was using Audacity as a data analysis tool. That's what I've been trying to say when I say when we think about repurposing. So you can't go and teach a teacher and say, you need to learn Audacity because it's going to be a data analysis tool because you don't know that they're going to use it that way. So that puts real challenges on us who are involved in teacher education, who are involved in teacher professional development. Because like I said, these tools are protein and we can use them in many different ways and it's hard to predict what it would be, that what potential use could be. So that's interesting. The second one is from uh, some teaching that I did this summer. And uh, I was teaching a course on leadership, and I always try to find an activity that matches sort of the content that we are teaching so that we can cover some technology as well. And in leadership, you always have these tensions, right? You have sort of top-down versus bottom-up, organic versus this, and you know, so on and so forth. And so we had some readings on that. And one of the activities I gave my students was, okay, let's make a list of all these tensions. So we had a Google Doc where we made a list of these tensions. And in the afternoon when they came back, I told them that given these tools, which is any digital camera that they have, a tripod, and this free website called Pixlr, which is like a Photoshop online, they had to create a representation of one of those tensions which showed the same person in more than one way. So that it would be like me talking to myself. Does that make sense? You know, like you know, have in the multiple roles in the movies. But they had to represent these tensions. So here is one representation. It's the same guy, and he's talking about how you can be you know, community of learners versus individual learner. So that was his way of representing it. Um, this one was organized versus chaotic. So you can see they had a lot of fun with it and they played with the technology and allowed us to sort of explore the idea of the tensions. That's okay, assignment done, over, semester's over, I mean summer's over, they've gone back to the classrooms. And then on Facebook, I get this email from this one teacher and that's not that because she was arrested, that's how we took pictures of all our students, including myself for the class, so just for fun. And what she told me, she was teaching a high school class on geometry. And what she had her high school students do is think about rotation, reflection, translation by doing this assignment. So you can see the students had to go and do the same assignment. And this was on Facebook, this is what she wrote. She said, had some fun with cloning, transformation, and geometry. Some groups got it, others not so much. Made for great discussions, though, about transformations and isometry. So to me, this is a great example of repurposing where we came up with an activity for something and what this teacher did, didn't say that, oh, this can be used only to represent tensions, but said, oh, I can possibly use this to teach geometry, to teach transformations in geometry, which I think is really exciting. A third example is what I call dynagraphs, which are sort of ways of representing functions. And even more interesting now is I'm with this project with Microsoft where we're looking at the Kinect as a way of representing mathematics. And this guy has written this program which lets you connect your PC to the Kinect device. And it's just fascinating because you can go in and by moving your arms, you can draw the equation of the line, you can change the angle, you can draw a parabola. I mean, it's a very kinesthetic way of understanding mathematics. Again, the Kinect system was not supposed to be designed for that, but it can be used for that. So one thing that you'd like to ask yourself is what do these examples tell us? Would this have been possible 100 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago? Then the question is, what will be possible five years from now? And what does it mean for learning in the 21st century? Right? And remember that we are just at the beginning of the 21st century. So there's a long way to go before the 21st century gets over, right? So the question, I think, is how do we prepare ourselves and our students I want to give one example of a friend of mine who's a teacher. His name is Sean Nash. He teaches uh, biology in Benton High School in St. Joe, Missouri. And I got, actually we met finally last year. We had, I've known him for four or five years. We just met online. I mean, we regard each other like, almost like soulmates. It's very interesting. He grew up in St. Joe, Missouri. I grew up in India. And we meet online and we have this great friendship. And he's a fantastic teacher. One of the things he does, his philosophy is that if you can't imagine anyone linking to what you're about to write, don't write it. So think about what that means. That students working in a high school classroom need to do authentic work. So you can go to his Principles of Biology website. It's a Ning. It's one it's like Hotel California. You can check in anytime you like. You can never leave, you know. 
people are there, members forever on that. I'm a member of that Ning. You have to ask to be a member of that Ning, but it's a public web space. All the work that students do is publicly available to see. Visitors from all these countries. And he has his students go out in the world, you know, take pictures, do analysis, report that back, and people can read that. He had his students develop representations of the Krebs cycle, and this is really interesting. So the students developed the representations. A year or so later, one of his students emailed him and said, Mr. Nash, do you know that this university has linked to what we did as a resource for learning about the Krebs cycle? Now think about that. That a bunch of high school students created something which, but again, it's because he put it out there, he made it clear to the students. So the stakes are very high for the student and for him that the work has to be good. And this is an interesting story where he uh, was using a textbook by this author, and one of the students posted, and the, he invited the author to join the Ning, and the author joined the Ning. And one of the students posted that it would be so cool to have a choral uh, from Iowa, you know. And I like the, you can tell it's a high school student because they say there were some freaking ancient chorals in Iowa, right? And one fine day, Nash gets a box in the mail which has that choral. And, the, and you can see the letter says, it is freaking amazing, you know? And the student says, by using the Ning site while just thinking my thought out loud, an author heard and sent me a piece of ancient history. I think that's really interesting. And again, I don't, and there are lots of examples that Nash can talk about and lots of examples I can talk about from just my putting stuff out there on the internet and putting it out there, having people access it and contribute back to me in ways that are really powerful. The other thing we often talk about is that we need to develop a community of learners. And Sean Nash has done that, which I find is really interesting. So this is a student of his, this is an email he got from a student who had graduated from his class, was now in college, and wanted to use an example of student writing that was going on in Sean's classroom for her college, something that she was doing. And I think that we often, I mean, and when I've talked with Sean and I said like, did you have a plan in mind? He said, no. I was just doing things and hoping that you know, things would work out and some things didn't and I stopped doing those and things that worked, that pushed them even further. And it's over time, over a period of four, five, six years that you see this beautiful sort of thing emerge. But it's this willingness to explore, to try different things, but not just explore and, and be done with it, but to create something and put it out there, to create, to make stuff, make this website, make his kids do right stuff. You know, and finally to share it with the world. I think that becomes critical here. So I'm going to segue to a slightly personal story here. Um, there's a new genre of writing, I don't know if you know about it, it's called SIPO. And it's basically scientific poetry. And the way this started is that a few years ago my son took some class somewhere and he had to create a blog. And he created it and then he completely of course forgot about it because you know, it was mandated on him to make a blog, so he made it and it was done. And my daughter is younger by three years. And she said, uh, how come he has a blog and I don't have a blog? I said, sure, you can have a blog. So we went to Blogger and we set up a blog for her. And then it was, what do you put in there? It's like George Bernard Shaw. Now what are they going to talk about, right? So she was at that time really interested in poetry. I said, why don't you write some poems and put it up there? So she started putting her poems up there and started writing some, which was good. And then school started. This was over summer. So when school started, she didn't have time to write all that much. But her science teacher had given her an extra credit assignment, given the class an extra credit assignment. This was in sixth grade. That you should read the newspaper for some scientific stories and report it back to the class. So I said, how about you read the story and you write a poem about it and report the poem back to class. That way you'll be doing your poetry too. So she liked that, so she started writing these things called sipos. So here's an example of one. That was what she looked like a few years back. And I blogged about it on my blog. Like, oh, this is so cool, and somebody go read my daughter's poetry and leave a comment that'll make her very happy. Sean Nash, of course, follows my blog, and I follow his blog. He says, how is it that this little girl is doing it and my students are not doing it? So he made that an assignment for his high school biology students, and they started writing these poems. And then they started visiting my daughter's website. This is one of the poems written by uh, one of his students. And they visited my daughter's website and left a comment or two, and she was so excited, you can see that that a high schooler follows my blog. She was, meant a lot to her. She's off the blog, now if you go, the blog's been dead for a year because now she's all into like glee and you know, stuff. And <laughs> it's okay, it's all right. It, it was good when it lasted and I'm happy about that. But, but see, the story doesn't stop here. This is what's, uh, what I think is so interesting about the internet and the world that we live in. 
there was there is a math teacher in a community college in California. So she said, how is this the science people are having all this fun? She logged on her math mama. Math mama, right? Said, how come they're, how come we are not doing it in math? And suddenly they had all these people around the world who were writing poetry about math. I wrote a few, because it just became this thing that you do, right? And now there is a wiki out there which has poems by a whole variety of people on mathematics. And I think, think about the chain of circumstance that leads to that. Right? It started with my just finding something to keep her busy in summer. Like, as a parent, that's prime motivation is really that, right? How do you keep them busy and out of trouble? Learning and all that stuff can happen, you know. If it happens, that's good, but keep them out of trouble, right? And look at how it sort of goes and grows and, you know, sort of. So I think this, this thing that we talk about technology, pedagogy, and content, I think they don't, I think those differences exist only in our minds in some way. That it really is about engaging with ideas, with these tools, because they offer us new opportunities to do things. And this idea of exploring, creating, and sharing, I think, become really important. So I want to digress a little bit at this point. Uh, wherever I'm invited to give a talk, I should have warned you, Justin, but I didn't. Um, I take a little bit of a segue to do what I call a shameless plug. And you can see the plug is quite shocked by that whole idea. And this is for uh, our uh, program uh, at Michigan State University. Um, you can find out more by going to edutech.msu.edu, or you can email me. It's a master's program as well as a PhD program. If you manage to talk to any of our grads here, do talk to them, because they are our best advocates. And our best students, and I say that with absolute confidence, are the students who come from the international schools. Because inherently, I find that people who are teaching in international schools are inherently risk takers. And when we get 40 or 45 or 50 of them together in this overseas, so this summer it's in Dublin. We have done it in France. We have done it in England. We get dynamite. I mean, these people are working, living, breathing, eating together, having a wonderful time, but really engaging with ideas of technology and pedagogy and content and these new tools and what we can do with them. It's very, very exciting. Um, we also have an on-campus face-to-face uh, -face hybrid version, as well as a fully online version. But I think many of you might be interested in the overseas version. If you are, drop me an email, and I can get you more information. I mean, I'm really proud of this program. Uh, I think that um, we had a colleague of mine from Netherlands visit and observe us this summer, and she said that I don't think there's a program like this around. Because it's a very intense, very engaging uh, program, and I'm very proud of it. So if you guys are interested in that, or if you're interested in this, which is a new hybrid PhD program, which is if you're working full-time and want to get a PhD, you can do it by coming to campus on, uh, in summer for a couple of weeks, and the rest of it you're doing online. We just admitted our new cohort. I think this is the best cohort of PhD students we have had. Excellent record practitioners working in the field, uh, and we have very great hopes from this. So that's the end of my spiel here. OK, so summing up. We live in a new ecology where standard solutions don't exist, really. Creativity, in some sense, is the only solution that we have. And we need to consider the total package, which is TPAC. And we get there not through magic, but rather a playful process of repurposing existing tools. So this is not old wine in new bottles. It's new bottles. It's new wine. I think it's very exciting for that reason. I want to end with this. Um, there was a commercial that came out on TV a few years ago. And somebody sent it to me. And I think a lot of educators were sort of forwarding it to each other. And I saw that commercial. And at first glance, I sort of liked it. Then the more I thought about it, something bothered me about it. And so I wrote a blog post. And then somebody came and told me that, how academic of you. Here's somebody who's showing you a video, and you are writing about it. So I took that as a challenge and made a mashup. Um, to reflect my views. So first, I'll show you the advertisement, and then we'll follow that with my mashup. I stand before you today to apologize. The system has failed you. I have failed you. I have failed to help you share your talent with the world when the world needs talent more than ever, yet it's being wasted every day by an educational system steeped in tradition and old ideas. Well, it's time for a new tradition. It's time to realize 
talent isn't just in schools like this one. It's everywhere. It's time to use technology to rewrite the rules of education. To learn how you learn so we can teach you better. It's time a university adapted to you rather than you adapting to it. It's time, time, time for a different, different kind of university. It's your time. Okay, so that was the commercial. So something was not right, and this is the age of the mashup. So here's my version. The system has failed you. A system steeped in tradition and old ideas. It's time to realize. Georgia. Okay. Thank you. So I think these three words really, um, I don't think we can predict what the future is going to be like and how we can, you know, what's the right way of doing things many times. But I think as long as we keep exploring, creating, and sharing, I think we're in a world now where a lot of good can happen, both for us as professionals and for um, the people in our care. I started with these two quotes in the beginning. Um, the technicalities matter a lot. But the unifying vision matters even more, and I think that that is even more true uh, today. So thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure being here. So thanks.